constant chaos is what Nivalis called water, that unformed substance ready to take on shape and give birth to everything. I've always been fascinated by water, by its vitality and the way it changes. When I was at school, we used to have to go for walks on Sundays, and we could choose where we wanted to go. And there was one place where the river Chawa ran into the Isis, and you were on a kind of island, and it seemed almost subterranean. It was very glady and dark, like the underworld, with water all around you, and I used to watch that for hours and hours. It made me wonder what all those creation myths meant. How could everything come out of water? What did it mean that the earth was without form and void, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and divided them? You can't see the forms in water until you disturb it. Any initial impulse, like this flow rushing into calmer waters, gives rise to form. For the resistance causes the flow to turn back on itself, creating a kind of mushroom shape. When water flows past something that resists it, like a stone or a post sticking out of the water, forms are created, like this rhythmic chain of vortices. Each spiraling vortex is an entity independent from the flow, with its own characteristics of rhythm and speed. And yet if you see it in the wider context, it's never separate from the flow and can only return to it. Our growth from childhood is like a spiral. We explore the world around us in ever-increasing windings as our confidence grows, slowly transforming the unknown to the known, chaos into cosmos. Good morning. Madam, what can I do for you? Um, please, may I have a new pair of shoe soles? Come this way, please. In many children's games, we find echoes of ancient rituals formed like the labyrinth around the spiral. For it is through experiencing the inward and outward windings of the spiral that we can begin to understand the windings of our own consciousness. <laughs> this game, The Shoemaker, enacts the spiral journey of the dead in his search for a new soul and his return path where he's chased back to earth. Yeah. 
sunflowers will be coming out soon. Yeah. <laughs> In the geometry of the spiral, there are basically two kinds. One is the Archimedean spiral, and the other is the logarithmic spiral. And the difference between the two is the speed. One is constant, like this, like a coiled rope, and the other is dynamic and increasing, like this. And that's the logarithmic spiral. And what determines the kind of spiral is the speed with which this point moves out and the speed with which it revolves. And with an Archimedean spiral, these two speeds are constant. So that you get something which looks like this. With a logarithmic spiral, And the speed of the point increases as its distance from the centre. And this is what distinguishes the two. We see it in the growth of shells like the Nautilus shell. And it seems to be that in nature there is one speed of growth which we find in the galaxies and we find in shells and plants. This is an ammonite, which is a similar family to the Nautilus, and yet the spiral here is much, much slower, and it's as if it was too slow to survive, and it became extinct. Whereas this, this spiral is dynamic, and it grows, and it grows fast. And not only is this a logarithmic spiral, but it's based on a very special speed, a very special proportion, which has been recognized since Pythagoras, since the Greeks, and is called the golden mean, or the golden section. And it's been called by Pythagoras divine, the divine proportion, because it runs through nature, from the galaxies, through shells, plants, and everything we see around us. And you can derive this proportion if you take a line. If you draw a line and you divide it, and you divide it so that the smaller part of the line is to the larger part of the line, as the larger is to the whole line. It's very simple, but it's very special. And nobody knows why this is so perfect. It's beautiful, it's simple. Joel Peirce is able to decipher spirals in all human activities. The word spiral is a word for a spiritual principle that is true throughout the universe. And we constantly need these reminders that come through the books and words and through the way of living of a few spirits amongst us who are messengers and who constantly remind the majority of the people who keep forgetting their eternal homeland. She shows the drawings, the pictures, makes books, and through the discovery of the principle of the spiral, which is one and probably the most important principle that we can uh, recognize, she discovers all the other unifying qualities. The only descriptions that we really have of the creation are those that we find in the mythological traditions and in the scriptures. 
Modern science has not been able to come up with any satisfactory description of how we come into being from nothingness. And what I'm trying to do is to use these concepts of the religious mystical tradition, of the creation myths, either through water or through the vibrations of sound, to relate these to the natural forms and how they demonstrate the dynamic force which gives them life. Can you turn the lights? As far as we know, the largest structures in the universe are the galaxies, huge glowing Catherine wheels of dust, gas and stars. To the naked eye, these galaxies appear as milky patches, just faintly visible. With the aid of a 200-inch telescope, about a thousand million suddenly become visible to us, and at least 60% of these have magnificent spiral structures. Nobody knows much about how they evolve or in which direction they are flowing. Whatever theory one adopts does not explain either the initial rotation or the instabilities necessary for these superb forms to come into being. What we call the Milky Way is looking edge-on through our own spiral galaxy. Our solar system is tucked into one of its arms. These models were made during the 18th century at a time when there was a great interest in astronomy, largely as a result of the work of Isaac Newton. Newton developed a very detailed mechanical picture of the universe, where laws found to be true in one place were assumed to operate everywhere. But before the end of the last century, science had begun to push further out into the depths of intergalactic space and deep into the nature of the atom. Modern physics has had a profound influence on general philosophical thought because it has revealed an unsuspected limitation of classical ideas and has forced us to revise many of our basic concepts in an essential way. For instance, the concept of matter or the concept of space and of time or of cause and effect, all these concepts are totally different in modern physics and with their drastic transformation our whole view of the world has begun to change. Now these changes of our basic concepts all seem to go in the same direction towards a view of the world which is very similar to the views held by mystics of all ages and traditions. I've made this photo montage to illustrate the idea of the cosmic dance, which appears in subatomic physics and in ancient Hindu mythology. The lines and curves in the picture are traced by subatomic particles in so-called bubble chambers. They bear testimony to a continual dance of creation and destruction in which all of subatomic matter is involved. It is a continual flow of energy in which patterns are formed and dissolved without end. In contrast to the classical mechanistic or Newtonian worldview, the view of the East is essentially an organic view. For the modern physicist and for the Eastern mystic, the universe appears not as a multitude of objects that are assembled into some huge machine, but rather as an interconnected cosmic web in which all things and events are interrelated, in which they form a flowing, changing, moving tissue of events. And man is an integral part of this network. It's not until we can stand back from the Earth that we can see just how much we live in water. 70% of the globe's surface is covered in water. 90% of animal life is found in it. And 70% of our own bodies consist of it.
Through the interplay of hot and cold air and hot and cold water, vortices are formed, some so enormous that they are large enough to cover entire continents. Laboratory investigations of tornadoes seem to show that they are not formed simply by a strong updraft and rotating air, as one would expect, but only when a sudden unseen draft of cold air drops from the top of a rotating thundercloud and feeds the system. In the center of every vortex is a still point, like the crown of the head from which all the hairs radiate or the center of the rose from which the petals unfold. Wherever the spiral appears in nature, it embodies certain very practical properties of wrapping, protection, strength, economy, of close packing, such as we see in the pine cone, and of allowing more space within less space, as in the cochlea of the ear. The form of a thing, in this case, the spiral form, is the visible expression of the essence of the thing, the underlying essential nature. Take, for example, the snail shell. Here you have a particular mathematical form in the shell of great simplicity. And this is an expression of the special nature of the growth of, of the snail that it's the simplest type of growth, purest sort of growth, without any change of shape. There are many other examples in nature of the logarithmic spiral. The sunflower is an interesting one where people have thought there was a special mystery that the seeds in the sunflower arrange themselves in spirals round here, and the numbers of spirals counted round this way and counted round that way are very special numbers, like 55, and 89. And this seems very odd at first sight. Why does one not have 88 or some other number? What is it that makes these very special mathematical relationships? But when one goes into it, one can see that these arise quite naturally, this special mathematical relationship. That as the sunflower grows, the various parts, identical parts, arrange themselves in a regular way, in rather the same way, that identical molecules form regular arrangement in a crystal. And the special mathematics of the sunflower is not mysterious, but is, or it is mysterious in the same sense that the special mathematics of the right angle triangle is mysterious. Pythagoras' theorem about the sum of the squares and all that. Now, the Pythagoreans did, of course, think that this mathematics did have some special mystical aspect. But today, we find this mystical element rather elusive. The really important mysteries are on another level. They're about relating the aspect of nature one obtains through scientific thought, analytical thought and observation, to the aspects of nature one gains through art and music, mythology, and religion and everyday life too. And I think that it is in approaching this more profound mystery that Jill's study of the spiral in all its various contexts has its importance. Science itself is increasingly showing that observer and observed are one. That the scientist is a participator in the world he is looking at and an integral part of his own experiment. Science is returning us to the concept of the unity of all things. Gradually go red. What are the implications of this kind of? I mean, what are, what are the implications in living systems? For example, the fact that that pattern could possibly be generated by by chemical. It is rather surprising that you can get such definite structures emerging from initially homogeneous mixtures of chemical of reactants and. This system I mean, has been considered as a paradigm for some kind of biological development. What are the, the physical reactions that are happening here? Is there any, anything which is not purely chemical? No, pure chemistry. It's pure chemistry. Does that detract in any way from it? No, it makes it remarkable. It's, it's a model 
of a very definite morphology arising out of a homogeneous, initially homogeneous medium. For example, one of the outstanding problems in developmental biology is how pattern emerges from the embryo. I mean, for example, you know, whether it's the segments on a worm or the patterns of, of bristles on a, on a fly, or even all the way up to, to bigger things, such as, uh, I don't know, I mean, my one has four legs, I guess, animals do. So really what we're seeing is the appearance, the emergence of order out of out of nothing or out of chaos or it's not chaos, it's not nothing. I mean it's something that's emerging. It's something, it's something which which is has no apparent order. Any kind of order which one sees I think is always rather surprising. Why? I mean because you don't think that the universe is basically intelligible. Basically. It's surprising that it is, I think. Or perhaps it isn't. I don't know. Surely it would be very surprising if it, if it wasn't intelligible, if it wasn't ordered and, and, and comprehensible. And Maybe. It's, it's surprising that the same forms keep reappearing. Surely these forms go right through all the different levels and also in, through the levels of our own consciousness. And this has to do with why we actually see these forms, because we only see what, we, what we're able to see in a sense, so that our minds actually structure what we see and our structure by the overall order. Familiarity breeds what we see, but whether it breeds contempt as well. Yeah. When you see order in something, I mean, if you recognise it, you recognise something which you're familiar with and which you are. So if you see, if you see order in something like this, you're recognising something which is in yourself, which is in your own mind or in your own organisation. It's a recognition. It may just, for me, generate excitement. But that is excitement, is recognition. I just call it excitement. <laughs> <laughs> The way we look at a thing actually determines what we see. In a book about Karlheinz Stockhausen, Jonathan Cott quotes Novalis' lovely description of a man who really had learnt to open his eyes. He watched the stars and imitated their courses and positions in the sand. Into the ocean of the air he gazed incessantly and never tired of observing its clearness, its movements, its clouds, its illuminations. To men and animals he gave his attention. On the shores of the sea he sat and looked for shells. To his own heart and thoughts he listened intently. He discovered familiar patterns everywhere and in this way often the strangest objects fell into order in his mind. He heard, saw, touched and thought all at the same moment. He loved to bring strangers together now stars were men to him, now men were stars. He knew just where and how to find this shape or the other, to make them appear. And thus he himself drew tones and passages from the strings. Music and silence have always been man's most powerful prayer. For the right sound can penetrate the heart directly. Perhaps more than any other composer writing today, Stockhausen understood this when he wrote in Nori, which means adorations. It's a new piece which we'll hear for the first time tonight in Donau Eschingen. He has noticed the similarity between the prayer gestures that men have used everywhere and at all times. And in this work, he uses them as an integral part of the piece. In all the holy scripts, we learn that there was first the word, vibration. It is not a word in human terms. It is a word of a being that is the spirit of the total. But there must have been an initial sound, which is like the stone in the water. And the vibrations still reach us.
Plato in the Timaeus wrote, All audible musical sound is given us for the sake of harmony, which has motions akin to the orbits in our soul, and is not to be used, as is commonly thought, to give irrational pleasure, but as a heaven-sent ally in reducing to order and harmony any disharmony in the revolutions within us. Surrounded by the chaos of her writhing snakes, the face of Medusa expresses the pain and confusion of a life without order. All the great religious masters have taught man ways to order himself, to find the still point in the centre of the vortex, like the still point in the heart of the whirling dervish, whose master, Jaladin Rumi, taught him to dance, to turn in harmony with all creation. For as Rumi said, if yonder heaven were not spinning, bewildered and in love like us, it would grow weary of its revolving and say, it's enough for me, how long, how long? ecstasy, his arms outstretched, his skirt expanded, he becomes the perfect man who links heaven and earth through order and proportion and stands between the two. The caduceus or staff of mercury has always been a symbol of healing in its true sense as holing, unfolding the subtle energies, integrating and balancing the psychological processes within us. Great courage is needed even to begin to unravel the self, and the attitude needed is like that of a warrior. This figure from Peru is both kneeling and standing, perfectly balanced between active and passive, attack and defense, life and death. The journey which St. George points out to us takes us down into those areas of ourselves we don't understand and find hard to accept. For the real hero is the man who has come to terms with himself, all of himself, brought each part together as a well-balanced whole. Man has always pictured this journey as a maze, and the maze as a model of himself. The oldest labyrinths go back almost 4,000 years. This one, already much later, was found when they uncovered Pompeii. Entering the maze is like deciding to take your life into your own hands, becoming responsible for yourself. Until then, you followed your old habits and desires. But now you must find a new sense of direction. For the old one will only confuse you. In the labyrinth, we become responsible through choice which confronts us at every moment. Once the journey's begun, there's no going back. Going back is as hard as going on. Suddenly, the path seems easier and wider. And you realize you're at the center. And there's nothing there but yourself. Jesus, who stands at the center, the pivot of the universe, led his disciples in a hymn to the Father, and the words of St. John reverberated as they danced. And we all circled round him 
and responded to him, Amen. The twelfth of the numbers paces the round aloft, Amen. To each and all it is given to dance, Amen.